diving into our topic for today. We are talking about hell. Usually people don't really preach too often about hell, eh? And so I know uh, when I was youth, a youth pastor here, I was youth pastor here almost four years, and I had a, a small group for uh, older high school students that I would have in my house, that we would play board games and have pizza. And I remember the one student, uh, he came to one of our events, and he stayed at my house chatting with me, um, really, really emotionally impacted by the problem of hell. And we chatted until about 3 a.m. that night. And he knew Christianity was true. He had had a personal experience with God, um, just... He had supernaturally seen God work in his own life. Uh, we had gone through apologetics and gone through the Bible. He knew all the reasons for the faith. He knew the Christian faith is true. But he was bothered by the emotional problem of hell to the point that he didn't want Christianity to be true. He knew it was, but he didn't want it to be true. And he thought, how can I tell people about God if I don't even like God? How can I tell people, you know, God loves you, but if you don't love him back, he'll torture you for eternity. Right? And so this is one of the biggest problems that we experience in the faith. Possibly the biggest theological problem that we as Christians have to deal with. Couldn't God just not torture people? That seems reasonable. Uh, why does he want people to go to hell? And why does it have to be for eternity? You know, we commit a few sins in this lifetime and we don't believe properly, so we get tortured for all of eternity, right? How do we make sense of that? This ends up turning off a lot of non-Christians, that they don't even want to hear the gospel because they have this idea of hell in the back of their mind. A lot of people leave the faith because they think, oh, I don't want to be part of that, all that fire and brimstone stuff. That's a, that's a negative influence in my life. I don't want to be part of that. So Christians don't like it either. We use the phrase, turn or burn, uh, pastors, when we hear sermons like that, which you're already probably thinking, oh, it's about hell, it's going to be one of those turn or burn sermons, right? Probably already had that thought because we don't, we don't like that. And we're also scared to evangelize to people because of the concept of hell. We don't even know how to address evangelism in that sense. How can God be good? How can I be okay with my friends and family going to hell? So one big problem with this, one big reason this is a problem for the church is no one talks about this. How often have you heard sermons on hell, right? In my years, I have, uh, so I do a lot of speaking engagements, right? I've, I've done, I don't, I don't even know how many. I tried to calculate it. I think it's like, like a 200 or something now. So I've done a lot of speaking engagements, and I've only been asked to speak on hell once. And that, even then, I was like, oh, someone's asking me to speak on hell. It was weird. So when I get opportunities to preach and I get to pick the topic, right? Nobody, nobody told me what to preach on. I asked, you have something specific. If they say no, I oftentimes like to choose the topic of hell. And so <clears throat> I've written on um, hell twice now, written, written things for different organizations. Usually they just accept whatever I give them. I've written on hell twice now. Both times they said, no, we don't want it. We're not going to publish it. We're not going to put it out. <clears throat> I ask my students in my, in my classes when I do apologetics and we come to this topic, I ask them, how many of you have heard a sermon on hell? And it's usually about one-third of the class. These are Bible school students that have been in church, most of them their whole lives. And one-third of them, or, or two-thirds of them, haven't even heard a sermon on hell. When you go to a funeral, how often have you heard the funeral pastor say, well, Bob's in hell now, <laughs> right? How many of you have heard the funeral sermon where they talk about the person as if they're in heaven, and you know for a fact they were not a believer. Right? It does not get discussed. And this has led to a terrible understanding within the church and within the world about the doctrine of hell. So today's sermon, we're going to be dealing with the topic of hell. I'm going to give you three different ways that people understand hell. And I believe two of them are trying to escape the doctrine of hell, trying to escape how Jesus taught about this subject in order to come up with something more comfortable. And so I'll show you why they're wrong. <laughs> and then I'm going to help us get a biblical understanding of what hell is, and we're going so that this will help us. By, by looking at what the Bible says, it'll help us avoid the bad answers and avoid the extremes. And then, through this understanding, how can we make sense of that? How can we make sense of God still being good and loving even though hell exists? So that's the purpose of today. So the different ways to understand hell, 
today we're going to look at the three, uh, the three ways. The first one is universalism, the idea that everybody goes to heaven. The second is annihilationism, meaning the unsaved are annihilated. They are obliterated. They do not exist anymore. And that's what hell is. Hell is non-existence. And then the third one is referred to in the literature. I hate the term, but it's, I find it to be ac uh, accurate. Eternal conscious torment, which I think is how the Bible describes hell. So there are verses in the Bible that seem to imply each one of these views. And these are contradictory views. You can't hold both of them at the same time. So there are verses that look like they support each. So what, what a lot of people do in their theology is they just want something to be true, so they cherry-pick the Bible to find some verse that supports their view and say, okay, there, I feel justified now. And they think that that's what I'm going to believe is true. But we need to do better than that. We need to look at all Scripture on the subject and think, what, does, what is the actual truth? What is God trying to help us understand about hell? So our first view we're going to go, go into is universalism. So everybody goes to heaven. Now, this is much easier emotionally because it completely eliminates the problem. There is no problem of hell. So one way that this works out is everybody goes to heaven when they die. That's a bit of an extreme version of universalism. Another way people try to handle this is they say, you know what, hell does exist. There is a hell. People do go there, but they can come to heaven at a later time. So think about the concept of purgatory, for example. Some people will say hell is just purgatory, but eventually hell will be empty. Everybody will leave hell and come to heaven. So people on this view still need Jesus. It's not as though they, they're doing away with Jesus or anything. The reason you can come to heaven is because of what Jesus did for us, but eventually everybody will end up coming to heaven. <clears throat> so why do they believe this view? I think the primary motivation is that, the prob is that hell is difficult. Hell is theologically problematic for us. It's emotionally difficult for us. In fact, there are people that don't believe in universalism. They're good theologians, they're good pastors, but they will call themselves hopeful universalists. Meaning, they think it's false, but they hope it's true. Because hell is problematic. People, generally speaking, don't like the doctrine of hell. So it's easier to just reinterpret Scripture a little bit, mess with things a little bit, and then we, we do away with the problem. So the question is, does Scripture back this up? And also, what has the church taught on this subject? So we're going to be looking in different places at the early church. Because, and, and I don't think the early church got everything right. I'm not saying the earliest Christians knew everything and they were right all the time. But it does help us understand the Bible was written, right? The disciples wrote the books of the Bible. And then immediately afterwards, there were Christians who knew the disciples and then people who knew them as well. And they wrote about these subjects. And so they were writing about their understanding of what their friends and their friends' friends had written. So we have their writing. So it's good for us to get an understanding of what the early church thought the Bible was about so that we can get closer to the context and get a better understanding of Scripture. So in this sense, the first person we can look at is Origen. So he was pretty soon after the disciples. He was pretty close to the context. He's a bit of an infamous Christian theologian because he's largely understood to be a heretic. He wrote some good stuff, but he had a very allegorical approach to Scripture, where everything's allegory and metaphor and not really meant to be treated seriously true. In fact, there's certain aspects of Scripture that he thought were nonsense, and if that's not bad enough, he had a heretical understanding of Jesus. He believed Jesus to be one of the human souls that was good and not stained with sin. So it was the most perfect human. And because this human was so perfect, God fused himself with him and made him divine. And if that's your view of Jesus, I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're a heretic. We can, we can sort that out, right? We can help you. But this is a heretical concept within Christianity. <clears throat> and so then the next one, the big universalist, was uh, Gregory of Nyssa. He was heavily influenced by Origen. So already his theology is influenced by a heretic. But then also he was what's called a Gnostic. If you're not familiar with that term, it's basically pagan philosophy that gets infused with Christianity later on. Uh, there's more to it than that, but just for the sake of it right now. So what he believed is God may be all in all, which scripture says. And so he understood this to mean 
all things will be restored to God and come back into God. Because in his Gnostic pagan philosophy, what, what they believed, what, one of the things they believed, it, it's a lot more to it, but one of the things they believed was God created everything, which is really just creation is an emanation of God. It's an aspect of God. And one day God will bring all of that back into himself, kind of like reabsorb creation in a sense. And it will all become part of God again. So that's why he believed that everybody will be saved because all of creation will be reabsorbed by God. This was his concept of universalism, which is obviously just pagan. It's Gnosticism. He didn't believe it because of what the Bible said. He was trying to fit his pagan Gnosticism into the Bible. So the two, these, and these were the, the guys. That's it for, early, for the early church. These were the ones that held to universalism. A heretic and a pagan Gnostic. So already off to a bad start. So what about scripture? Does that say that we will all be saved? There are a few verses that come to mind that give this, implica- that give this sort of idea. Um, the famous passage, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everybody. Also, God will reconcile all things to himself, which I was just talking about. And then also that Christ's act on the cross resulted in justification and life for all people. Those kind of give the hint, oh, hey, maybe universalism is true. But you'll notice they're not explicitly saying universalism. These can be understood on other views, right? They're not explicitly teaching that. But we do have other verses that teach the exact opposite, and they're quite explicit. We'll go more into those later, but just for now, in Matthew 25, it talks about eternal punishment. Hard to understand how people could come to heaven, everybody could come to heaven, if they are being eternally punished, right? But that's how Jesus described hell in his sermon on the afterlife. Right? Matthew 24 and 25 is called the apocalyptic discourse, meaning he's, he, Jesus is giving a sermon about eschatology, end things, right? And he talks a lot about heaven and hell. That's the purpose of the sermon. And how he describes it is eternal punishment. Hard to understand how all people could be saved. Also, we see in Revelation 14 and 20, where, it's, uh, where hell is described as torment and no rest forever. Hard to understand how universalism could even possibly be true on that. Also, logically speaking, how could everybody go to heaven? Does Hitler go to heaven? Right? It kind of all comes back to Hitler all the time. We use him as an example all the time. But realistically, does Hitler go to heaven? There's lots of people that are wicked. They don't want forgiveness. They are not repentant. There is no submission in their heart. Why would they go to heaven? And it seems as though when a person goes to hell, the Holy Spirit's influence in their life is removed, right? That's part of what hell is. It's absence from God. The Holy Spirit is the only reason any of us accept uh, forgiveness in the first place. If you remove the Holy Spirit, they will never repent, no matter what. So, in this sense, does God force forgiveness on people? Is God going to make people um, ask for forgiveness? Scripture seems to say the exact opposite, that there will be many people who will never ask for forgiveness. It, it just seems odd. Like, if somebody lives their life as an atheist or, or, or something and says, like, I don't want that Jesus of yours, but then you die and in the afterlife God says, too bad, I'm going to force it on you, right? Like, it seems disrespectful to their, to their choice even. God created them with choice and then he's going to remove it, right? So it seems odd. So, to sum up universalism, um, there's very little support within the early church They're literally heretics and Gnostics. It doesn't handle all of Scripture. It ignores the main verses on hell. And it doesn't make sense logically. And the justification mostly comes from emotion, which is not a good source of truth. So the next view, annihilationism. This is a very popular way to handle the doctrine of hell today. And I'm sad to say I even see it a lot in the Bible college. So uh, pray, pray for the future of the church in this, in this regard, because this is one of the things that is seeping into uh, Christian theology fairly quickly. So the belief here is when you die, you either go to heaven or you're just obliterated, right? You, you, you are not granted continued existence. Uh, so there are varying positions on this. There are people who will think that hell as a place exists and that when you die, you go there for a bit as a punishment, but then you're obliterated. 
So just say Hitler. Hitler might have to spend a thousand years in hell suffering, but your, your really nice aunt that bakes cookies for the children on the street, she only has to go to hell for a couple of days, and then she gets obliterated. So there's varying views on this, but the main idea is the problem of hell is eliminated because people do not suffer for eternity, they're obliterated. So in this sense, is it eternal punishment? Yeah. It actually kind of fits the bill in that sense. It's a punishment, you're being punished, and it doesn't stop. You're obliterated, you're taken out of existence, so yet that never gets fixed, right? You're out of existence, it's not like you come back or something. So it is an eternal punishment. <clears throat> so a problem here is I find it weird. The, the Bible seems to describe hell as if people are being punished there and that they are still there. And that seems to be an odd way to word it if annihilationism is true. If we think of, just say, just say in our society, if you go to prison and you get a life sentence, you are still being punished. However, if you get capital punishment and you are killed by the government, would you say that they are still being punished? Nope. You wouldn't word it that way. It just seems like a weird way to talk about it. And that's the way the Bible describes hell. So their reasoning for this is they say death is the cessation of life or existence. So they kind of read their own definition of what death means into every Bible verse. So they see, the, I've seen annihilationists, that they'll give a whole list of dozens of verses and they'll say all of these support annihilationism. But really it's because they've loaded their definition of what death means into that. One of the big ones that they use is Ecclesiastes 9, 4-6, where it says, the dead know nothing. The dead don't know anything. They're just, they're just gone, right? That's one of the big verses that they use to justify this. However, if you know anything about the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon after his sinful life. And he had realized how pointless everything is. And he's basically having an existential crisis. So it is the rambling, depressed, existential crisis writings of a guy that's been uh, just engulfed in sin. That's what Ecclesiastes is. It's actually bad advice in most places because he says like wisdom is worthless. It's useless. Eh, it doesn't sound right, right? The point is almost to see this is where a worldly worldview will get you. Don't be like Solomon, right? So to get our theology about hell from a verse where he's going on depressed ramblings about his life crisis, that doesn't seem like the right place to get our theology from hell, about hell. It seems like a better place would be the teachings of Jesus, right? <clears throat> so there are other passages for annihilationism that say things like when somebody dies, they are no more or something like that. But in each one of these cases, it's not teaching about the afterlife. That's not the purpose of the verse. That's not the goal of the verse. So then how do they justify it biblically? So again, it comes down to their description of what death and destruction mean. And they build their own concept of annihilation into those concepts. So different verses will say things like, destroy the body and spirit in hell. And they say, well, destroy means it doesn't exist anymore. Or it'll say, um, yeah, eternal destruction, the worm doesn't die. In other words, you're a corpse. A corpse isn't animated. You're gone. Right? Or that, you, that, you, that there is death or that you will perish, these sorts of words. And they build their own definition of what death and destruction mean into the words so that the verses will read the way they want them to read. However, this is a problem called circular reasoning. You've probably heard that term before. It's also referred to as begging the question. It's a logical fallacy. You would not agree with their interpretation of these verses unless you already agree with their position. So their position is needed in order to see scripture that way. They've built their own answer into their premises, which is a fallacious way to argue. <clears throat> there are also scriptures that are explicitly against it, <clears throat> as we'll see. So this idea of eternal punishment, right? They can grant eternal punishment, but then we see verses that talk about hell being a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, we don't really use that term anymore, but what gnashing of teeth is, at one point it says the Pharisees did this towards Jesus, right? Jesus was just making them so mad, they were at him, angry, gnashing their teeth at him. So there is sadness and anger in hell. 
That's what hell is all about, sadness and anger. And how can you be sad and angry if you don't exist anymore? And then also, Revelation 14 and Revelation 20, annihilationists admit these are the difficult ones because it says there is torment and a lack of rest forever. And also says there is torment day and night forever. <clears throat> so these are scriptures that are explicitly against it. The verses in their favor, you have to use circular reasoning to get their conclusion. The verses against it are explicitly against it. So then what about the early church? Did any theologians teach this concept of annihilation? Um, <clears throat> when do annihilationists do this, they will try to pick other theologians out as well, but they're still just reading their own definitions into it. The only real person that taught annihilationism is a guy called Arnobius of Sicca. You probably haven't heard of him because he wasn't very important. He didn't really do very much. And so he did explicitly teach annihilationism, but he's the only one. And then we get lots of people saying the opposite of what he taught. In fact, we even get different people explicitly condemning this idea directly. So we do see in the early church people explicitly teaching against it. Clement of Alexandria and Marcus Minucius Felix, they explicitly taught against annihilationism, saying, one of them said, all souls are immortal, even the wicked. And annihilation would be better for them, but there, that is false. There will be no end to their suffering. The other one said, many will hope for annihilation, but that's false. They are restored and resurrected for punishment without end. And if you're interested, like, they're resurrected for punishment? That's what it says in John 3. So we'll go more into what the early church th uh, taught about hell in a few minutes, but the basic idea here is we have explicit Bible verses against it and the early church explicitly against it. So then where do we, they get this concept of annihilationism from? The foundation of annihilationism is actually fairly recent, past 200 years. It comes from a tradition called the Millerites. You probably haven't heard of that, but I bet you you've heard of Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists. Now, Seventh-day Adventists are kind of coming around in terms of being a legitimate denomination, but historically, not trying to be insulting here, but historically, it was a cult. And Jehovah's Witnesses, still very much a cult. If you're not aware of that, we can, we can talk about that more after the service, or you can email me. I'd love to chat with you about that, but very much a cult. And so the background, historically, of where annihilationism comes from as a theology comes from this movement called the Millerites, which then split into those different groups. So it's cults, it's false prophets, they were predicting the world all over the place. It was actually a joke in the newspapers that the, the Millerites were out on their rooftops waiting for Jesus to return, and he never did, right? The JWs, I forget how many times they've predicted the end of the world. I think it's seven or eight now, and they've just, they've just given up trying. Uh, so, and they have explicit false prophets. Uh, I think her name was Ellen White, obviously plagiarizing material from other books and giving false prophecies. So the foundation of annihilationism comes from cults realistically. <clears throat> so, annihilationism, um, in terms of the early church, if we want to summarize it a little bit, in terms of the early church, there was only one person that was actually for it, and multiple that were against it and taught against it. In terms of scripture, you need to believe it already in order to see it in scripture, and there's nothing that really teaches annihilationism in scripture at all. But there are scriptures explicitly against it, describing the torment as active and going on indefinitely. The theology has its foundations in cults and false prophets. The real motivation here is they don't like what Jesus taught about hell. So they're trying to find a way out. So then, what is hell actually? If universalism and annihilationism is false because they try to do away with the problem of hell, then what's left? Is it just a place of torture? Right? It's eternal conscious torment that lasts forever, meaning it goes on forever, doesn't end, you still exist, you're aware, and there is suffering involved. So then, is this some kind of divine torture chamber? Right? You get some picture of the, the guy in the red jumpsuit with the pitchfork stabbing you and whatever, and that there's demons that work there, and they're just trying to find different ways to torture you. This understanding that we have in, in, in media, in the world, even within the church, that hell is something like an exquisite torture chamber in God's basement. This comes from Dante's Inferno. 
So if you're not familiar with that, this was a piece of poetry written a long time ago, hundreds of years ago. It was allegory and poetry and even irony. It was almost humorous for the sake of irony at times. It is not based on the Bible. There's no scriptural backing for any of these concepts. And just to, just to show you an example of the irony in this, if you were in Dante's Inferno, if you were a bad person during this life and you caused a lot of division, just say you came between friends, you came between marriages, maybe you were a political leader and you brought division in your land, in the afterlife, you would be cut in half over and over and over again. As an ironic punishment, you cause division in life, you'll be divided in death, right? <clears throat> There's all sorts of weird things in this. Horned demons that seem to work in hell as like a job or something. They're whipping people, cutting them in half. There are weights crushing people. There's vicious monsters like minotaurs and centaurs ripping people apart. People are boiled in tar, blood, and poop for some reason. Uh, people are frozen in ice in contorted positions. And the weirdest one, some people are transformed into trees and then eaten by harpies. I don't know why that, that's in there. But this affected people's thoughts on hell. People were not educated. People weren't reading the Bible for themselves. They see this idea in a popular piece of literature, and this affected the Christian church's understanding of hell and even the world's understanding of hell. So now people have this concept in mind, and they think to themselves, why would God do that? How can God be loving if he has something like this? Why would God take pleasure in exquisite types of torture? But that's not actually a problem because that's not what we find in Scripture. So what does the Bible actually say about hell? There are multiple places that describe hell as being eternal, as never-ending. So that concept is correct. It says the worm doesn't die, the fire is not quenched, eternal punishment, eternal fire, eternally away from God's presence, um, eternal uh, life there, eternal contempt, that the afterlife is eternal, just the same concept over and over again. It's never-ending. And in fact, if some people say, oh, well, you know, the word doesn't really mean eternal, right? They try to quibble about that. In Matthew 25, it talks about the afterlife, uses the exact same word in the same context, even the same sentence to refer to heaven and hell. So if you think heaven is eternal, it's the same thing about hell, the way Jesus describes it in his sermon on hell. So in terms of descriptions of what hell looks like, let's not look at the extremes in terms of is it a, an exquisite torture chamber where people are ripped apart or whatever. Like People get this idea that hell, you will just be filled with so much pain that every moment you're not even able to form coherent sentences because you're just in extreme pain all the time. The Bible doesn't describe it that way. So let's not, let's not go to extremes in that direction either. Let's see what the Bible says. It does describe it badly, right? But it's not Dante's Inferno. It describes it as weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, darkness, destruction, flames, burning, torments, a lake that burns with fire and sulfur, and everlasting punishment. These are the actual descriptions, and that's all of them. I'm not leaving some of them out. So those are the descriptions of the words that are used to talk about hell. Now, you will notice these are active words that seem to be where, where there is a person participating in it. You're not annihilated, right? You are actively being uh, punished in this sense. But also notice there is nothing about demons torturing people or anything about torture or anything about demons working there or something like that. Or there's no weird, strange, ironic punishments. So then let's look at how the early church understood these passages. Here's a list of the people that wrote about hell, that talked about it as eternal conscious torment. You remember, for universalism, there were two, a heretic and a Gnostic, and for annihilationism, there was one guy that nobody's really heard of. These are the ones that talked about hell in the traditional sense. Basically, everybody else. This was how they understood what the disciples taught in Scripture. It is a place of darkness, death, pain, unquenchable fire, wrath, indignation, tribulation, anguish, full of cursing, punishment. And, and one thing that's weird that came up quite often, being devoured without ever actually being gone. And they would, they would describe it further and say, yes, you're being devoured by the worm, just say, but you will never be finished being devoured. <clears throat> 
There's no rest, no soothing, no death to deliver them. Your body will not waste away. It will never end. It's eternal, unceasing. The damned are immortal. Nothing can rescue them at this point. Annihilation would be better, but there will not be an end like that. And it also contrasts animal life with human life in places where they say animals are just annihilated, they stop existing. Humans continue to exist forever. So it's explicitly against annihilation, annihilationism and universalism and teaches using the same words. Sometimes they go a bit further, right? They, talk, they do use the word torture at times. They do use um, different things that we, do, that we don't find in Scripture. But for the most part, they're just using words that Jesus used for the most part. They're just trying to describe it the way the disciples and Jesus understood it in the plain reading of Scripture. So the point of looking at these early church uh, fathers, I'm not just saying believe whatever they say, right? They can be wrong too. But this shows this was the interpretation of hell in the, in the early church. This was how people understood hell from the very beginning, just using biblical language. <clears throat> so then, coming, in, uh, coming into how this can be helpful for you, I've helped give a biblical teaching on what hell actually is described as in Scripture, and I've helped tear down the two bad answers. So now that we have an, a good understanding of hell, how do we justify this with the concept of a good God? How can God still be good if this kind of hell exists? <clears throat> One problem I find is our understanding is built on our own cultural bias. In our worldview, we don't really appreciate the concept of wrath and justice. In other worldviews, they do, and they don't really have a problem with hell. So part of it is just our own cultural understanding and our own cultural bias. We don't really face a lot of extreme harm or extreme evil or injustice or war or these sorts of things. And when we do experience evil, we cry out for justice. Right? Even today in the world, with the little bits of abuse that we see in the world, we cry out for justice in those, in those situations. So in this sense, other cultures that do experience the evil that this world has to offer, they cry out for justice. And they understand God's love as being justice. Now, I might have mentioned this before in a sermon that I did here years ago. For, so for those of you who have heard this before, uh, forgive me, but I think it's worth mentioning again. Um, in order to get an understanding of how the Israelites understood the concept of God's love being shown through wrath and justice. That seems so weird to us in our culture, but it makes perfect sense from other points of view. So you know that song, his love endureth forever, right? We've all heard that one. That's in Psalm 136. You might not have actually read that psalm because they kind of leave some stuff out from the popular song. Here's how, this, how, here's how it actually goes in the Bible. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn in Egypt. His love endures forever. To him who struck down the great kings. His love endures forever. Right? Their concept of God's provision was that he will destroy the evil that he will punish the wicked. That was part of how they understood the love of God. Israel liked the concept of punishment and justice. God loves us, so he is our protector. He will punish the wicked. He will bring justice. That's part of the goodness of God. They actually didn't care for God's mercy and grace. Think about the story of Jonah. He's supposed to go preach to the Ninevites. He doesn't want to. They are evil. They deserve to be punished, God. So they have a problem understanding that. But from our perspective, oh, we have an easy time with that. That's not a problem with us. That's not a real theological problem. But for them, it was. So just our own cultural bias ends up causing us to have a problem with something that's very biblical and very good in a sense as odd as that sounds from our perspective. We also end up in a bit of a catch-22 situation. We get upset at the problem of hell, but we also get upset at why God allows evil in the world. So we're upset with God when he punishes evil, but we're also upset when he allows evil. Well, what do you want? Do you want him to punish it or do you want him not to punish it? We're upset both ways. 
Another big aspect in this discussion is the concept of justice. Justice requires punishment. <clears throat> uh, go back, yeah, there you go. So if there is no punishment, there is no justice. That's just how things are. For example, if someone murders a member of your family and the person is giving, uh, given a restraining order, they're under house arrest, there's an, armed guard, there's an armed guard, don't worry, he won't harm anybody again. You think, no, there should be justice, there should be, there should be more, there should be some kind of punishment. It's not that we want revenge, it's that there has been evil and there should be justice put in place, there should be punishment. As an example of this, my mom worked in a prison for, for a few years back in the day before she was married. And there was a guy who had raped a girl and he had a family and a job. So they said, well, you know what, we'll just let you serve your time on weekends. So he would go to work and go back to his family during the week and then go serve a few hours on the weekend and then come back to his family and job during the week after being a rapist. That makes me angry. And when I hear about things in the news where I see abuses of power and whatnot, it makes us angry because we think, no, we cry out for justice. We know there should be some concept of punishment. And also, theologically speaking, this is the whole purpose of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is paying for our punishment. We deserve punishment for our evil. All of us, no matter how good you are. You know you've sinned. You know there are things that at times you just cringe remembering things you've done in your past. We're all sinners. We all deserve that justice against us. We all deserve that punishment. And that's why Jesus died and shed his blood for us. The punishment of sin needed to be fulfilled. That's the whole point of Jesus, is this concept of justice. So if someone rejects Christ, Jesus has paid for their punishment. He's done it already. But they say, I don't want that. Well, guess what? Your punishment is not fulfilled. So you have to pay it still. That's what hell is. So if you're paying for your own punishment, it's because you've rejected the free gift of grace that has been offered to you. But this punishment isn't Dante's Inferno style of hell. Hell is a place of sadness and anger and rejection and fire with all the other sinners that have rejected Christ in the world. It's torment, but it's not torture. <clears throat> so another question that comes up in regards to this justice aspect is, it seems unfair because we're getting an infinite punishment for a finite amount of sin. So if you think of somebody during this life, they sin, just say they're even a bad sinner. They've still only sinned so much, right? So why are they punished infinitely, forever? First of all, I think we don't really understand the gravity of sin. We don't understand how bad sin is. We have sinned against the infinite, all-powerful God. And he doesn't deserve it, right? Like, he deserves our worship. He doesn't deserve to be sinned against. And he's infinitely powerful and, and awesome and beautiful. So we deserve an infinite punishment. We can't actually be punished enough for our sin against God. And if, and if that sounds odd, think of it this way. If a bug kills a child, just say a kid gets a bug bite and it ends up turning bad and it, the kid ends up dying. When we think about that, just say you got the bug. Just say you're the parent of the child and you have the bug. That bug cannot be punished enough for what it has done to your child. There's no amount of suffering that that bug can take to actually equal what it has done. That's the same with us. We have sinned against God. We actually can't be punished enough. <clears throat> and in this sense, I also think in hell, why do we think that they'll stop sinning once they go to hell? People in hell continue to sin. They're still the way they were on the, in this world. If somebody's vulgar and blasphemous and violent and filled with rage and lust right now, why think that all of a sudden just goes away when they get to hell? They're still that person. If anything, they'll be worse and get worse and worse and worse over time. That's probably why hell is so bad, right? Because people will get worse and worse and worse. So in this sense, each person in hell continually earns their place in hell every moment. <clears throat> Another thing that I think is the biggest issue for us to understand today is um, understanding how the gospel relates to hell. The gospel is the whole point of this. God does not want to send people to hell. And this, I think, is the big thing that turns people off in regards to the doctrine of hell, that they think 
Why does God want to send people to hell? He doesn't. That is not a scriptural concept, as though God's just itching to send people to hell. Oh, you've been bad. I'm going to do bad things to you when you're dead. That's not how God is viewed in Scripture. God does not want to send people to hell. The, our, our idea of hell is something like demons live in hell and work there as torturer, torturers for the human race or something. right? Again, that is not what the Bible describes. The Bible says hell was created for Satan and his angels. It says that in Matthew 25, 41. It is a punishment for angels for rebelling against God. It was not meant for humans. So then why do humans go to hell? Because of their submission to Satan. God originally gave dominion of the earth over to humanity. We see that in Genesis 1, 28. God creates the world and he tells, says to the humans, you're in charge. This is yours. You have dominion. That's the word used. It's like a kingdom, right? So you, we were given dominion. We handed that dominion over to Satan. We gave up our dominion, and now Satan is the Lord of this world. Scripture describes him as the God of this world, the ruler of this world, the power of the prince of the, uh, the prince of the power of the heirs. So we end up with this sort of a dichotomy between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. In Colossians 1.13, it says, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So humanity followed Satan in his rebellion against God and gave allegiance over to Satan rather than to God. So if you follow Satan, you get his reward hell. That's the whole point. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Humanity was already on the way to hell. And God says, no, I don't want that. I want to save them. And so Jesus dies on the cross and sheds his blood to pay the punishment we deserve to save us from what we were already going towards. It's not like God is saying, hey, you're not good enough. I'm going to torture you if you, do, if you don't shape up. It, he's saying, I created you for good things. Why are you following Satan to hell? Let me help you. And we say, no, nah, don't want it. So they go to hell. <clears throat> the whole point of the cross is that Jesus defeated the powers of darkness, took on our sin and forgave us to restore our relationship with God and bring allegiance to God. You know how we talk about Jesus Christ being our Lord and Savior? And we say that so much that it's almost a joke in cultures, like the Christian's going to walk up to you and say, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? We don't really know what that means anymore. We don't use words like that. What that means for him to be your Lord is he's your authority, your head. You have allegiance to him. He is over you. He represents you, right? You can almost think of it like a boss relationship. He's in charge. If you do anything wrong, it falls on him. He's the boss. And he pays the price for what you've done because you have allegiance for him. You are, you are submitted to him as your Lord and Savior. So God does not want us to go to hell. So if we reject the forgiveness that is freely offered by Christ, if we reject Jesus Christ as ruler and Lord of our lives, then we're still following Satan. We're still following him in that rebellion. If somebody says, well, I'm not following Satan. I just don't want Jesus. That doesn't mean I'm following Satan. If you're not following Jesus, you are in rebellion against God. That's the domain of darkness, being in rebellion against God. So if, we, if God does not want us to be in rebellion, he doesn't want us to end up with Satan's punishment. He wants to save us from hell, and he has gone to great lengths to do that at his own personal cost. In Ezekiel 18 and 33, we can read about this. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. So turn and live, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die? And sometimes, um, it seems unrelated, but I think it's very related here. Sometimes we think to ourselves, why is Jesus taking so long? Right? Just, just bring us home. 
Why is Jesus taking so long? You know the answer? There's an explicit answer for that in Scripture. It's in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Why is Jesus taking so long? He doesn't want people to go to hell. That's the whole point. So we think, well, why does God want to send people to hell? He doesn't, right? That's good news. God loves people. God is patiently waiting for more people to repent. God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all people to repent. We know not everybody will repent. We know there will be many that will say, I don't want anything to do with that Jesus, right? But that's their choice. God does not want them to go to hell. And if we read, you're you're all familiar with John 3.16, but I find the next couple of verses after that to be helpful as well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's the problem of hell we have. Well, why does he do it? He doesn't want to condemn you. He didn't send Jesus here to condemn us, right? God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Humans are already condemned. It's not like God chooses to send them to hell. They're already on that path. They're already going there by their sin and their evil. They are naturally on their way to hell. Salvation is God rescuing us from the hell that we already deserve. God has gone to great lengths to save us from the path that we're on. So if the question is, why does God send people to hell? He doesn't. You're already on the path there by choosing to ally yourself with Satan. From God's perspective, you can picture God saying this. Why are you still following Satan? I didn't make hell for you. I made it for him. Why are you following him there? I've provided a way to save you from that. Why aren't you accepting the hand that is trying to save you from destruction? Why do you have the devil as your Lord and ruler? Why are you a part of the kingdom of darkness, which will surely fall? Why don't you allow Christ to be your authority? Ally yourself with the one who loves you, not the one leading you to hell. So as we wrap up today, if you're, if you're interested in more from me, I have my, my website and my podcast there, and I also have a sign-up sheet in the lobby. If you want to sign up for my email newsletter, that sort of thing, and keep up to date with what I'm doing, I have the, the sign-up sheet over at the missions corner there. Um, but for now, as we're wrapping up, like I was saying, God does not want you to go to hell, right? So in this moment, do you want to give your allegiance to Christ? Do you want to submit to God and say, you know what, this offer of free gift of salvation seems pretty good. What Jesus did for me seems pretty good. I'm going to pray in a moment. You can pray with me if you want to receive the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers you. So our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you, God, for what you did on the cross. We thank you, Jesus, for paying the price that we owe, for taking that justice upon yourself. We thank you, God, that you are still just and wrathful against evil, that you will fix the world. But we also thank you, Lord, for your patience for the lost, for those of our loved ones that do not know you yet. We thank you, God, for waiting for them, for your grace and mercy and patience. Help us, Lord, to have the courage to be a witness to them, to want them to come to heaven as much as you do. Give us that passion in our hearts, Lord, and encourage us. Equip us by your Holy Spirit and encourage us. Give us that passion, Lord. And also, help people to remember what they've learned today. That that can change their theology, but also so that they can be a better witness and help change people's hearts and minds in relation to this. Encourage them to evangelize to the people around them, Lord. And also, Lord, we pray for those that uh, don't know you here today, Lord, but they want to know you. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins transform our hearts and minds from the inside out, God. Make us more like you. Please, God, we, we, we accept the, what Jesus did on the cross as payment for our sins, and we call you our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray.
If you're interested in more, please like and subscribe to get updates for new content. You can also check out the Ultimate Questions podcast with John Topping or go to johntopping.com.